Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 40, I chat with Chris Huston about his incredible life as a musician, recording engineer and producer, and acoustical engineer. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded November 1st, 2010. Episode 40, Stories from the Musical Trenches. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off the lifetime of your new account, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code HTG. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here with ultimateavmag.com and hometheatermag.com. This week's guest geek is Chris Huston, uh, Vice President of Acoustical Engineering for Reeves Audio, a recording engineer and producer, and a musician with some incredible stories from an amazing life in the business. Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. Now, Chris, you're uh, speaking to us from the Sound Kitchen, a very famous, well-known recording studio in Nashville, Tennessee. I think you're in the big boy control room, right? Correct. Yes, sir. Great. So we're going get to get into quite a bit of that. It's a room that you designed, at least uh, did the acoustical work on, and we're certainly going to get into talking about that. I'd like to first, though, mention to those of you who are listening live, watching live the stream at live.twit.tv or logged on to the chat room at irc.twit.tv that you can uh, pose questions for Chris as we go, and uh, our engineer will pass them on to me, and I'll pass along as many as I can to Chris um, as we go. So let's start with where you are, Chris. You're in the big boy recording studio, the control room at the Sound Kitchen, and maybe you can... Uh, uh, well, I was going to say maybe you could pan around and show us show it to us, but we've had a little trouble with the camera, so maybe that's not such a good idea. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> let's let's leave it where it is. But you can see in the background there if uh, if John will show us the um, there we go. Uh, you can maybe move out of the way and show us that uh, there you are in the control room. Oh no, the camera started following you. <laughs> um, in any event, there you <laughs> well are in trained, the control. Room. Well trained. It's a well trained camera. Yes. Um, and we're going we're gonna to start talking about um, uh, your work as a studio designer, an acoustician, um, but I sure would like to start with the early years. Chris Huston, the early years. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you grew up in Liverpool, correct? Correct, yes. And uh, as I understand it, you actually went to art school with John Lennon. That is correct, yeah, 1957. Wow. And you played with him uh, in one band or another? No, no, no. Um, uh, I was in a group that became a group, uh, became called The Undertakers. He was in another group called The Quarrymen and several other names. Then they were Silver Beetles and then The Beatles. Mm. Uh, and um, it was not unusual for them to open for us and us to open for them. And everybody knew everybody. We were all friends. It was kind of a small musical community, I guess, in Liverpool at that time, huh? It was a small community, but amazingly, there were like over 300 groups playing every weekend. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> were there, were there yeah, that there was, many venues? Well, there were three, yeah, there were, there was like a, a hierarchy of like there were three rings, say. The center of the city was the main sort of uh, ring and uh, there were a certain amount of groups maybe 20 25 groups that were played the city center mm -hmm. and then there was a uh, all the pubs which are in the city and, uh, and then all the way out to the suburbs and things mm -hmm. and then beyond that there were church halls and roller rinks <laughs> and we even played there. Everybody played there. The Beatles played at the Apollo Roller Rink with us one evening, you know. I mean, um, there was this whole thing going on. It was quite amazing, quite amazing, the energy. Wow. It was quite a, a seminal time, too, for the, I don't know if it's, I'd call it the birth of rock, but certainly um, the maturation, perhaps. I mean, uh, 
Yeah, it wasn't the birth of rock because we were copying American music. Um, we played three chords basically to start with, <laughs> and what we what we couldn't finesse, we'd stamp our feet to. You know, um, mm -hmm. it was uh, pretty primitive to begin with, but it was so much fun and the energy. I mean, if I could relay the energy to you guys. There you go, there's a picture of us. That was taken at a TV studio. From the far left, you can just see the little ring that's on a TV camera. And they mm. brought in a horse-brawn hearse for us. Pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now that's you on the left, right, playing bass? No, guitar. Oh, guitar. Ba yeah, bass player is next to the drummer. Oh, I got you, okay. But you that's you on the left, though. Yes, it is, yes. Okay, very good, very good. Now, um, you sent me a number of stories that I would love for you to relate to our audience, uh, one of which is when the Undertakers were in Germany uh, playing in West Berlin, and you took a tour to East Berlin and got detained <laughs> by the East Ber at Checkpoint Charlie. This is true. Um, what happened was we were actually playing at the Star Club in Hamburg, and uh, we finished, and our um, manager had had a school friend he'd gone to school with that worked now work for Reuters, uh, the big press agency in Berlin. Mm -hmm. So be we had a new record out on Pi Records, and it was called "If You Don't Come Back." It was an old Coaster song. So th these two uh, guys came up, cooked up this little thing where we would go to Berlin. The press, the Reuters guy would obtain some East German money, which was basically not allowed outside of the, you know, the Eastern Bloc, but you could get it, you know. And then we would get, uh, try and make as much trouble as we could uh, <laughs> at, at the border. So that's what we decided to do. So um, the, I, uh, myself and the um, saxophone player were both 21. He was 22, I was 21. So we were the ones who were entrusted with the money. It, we didn't think we should give it to uh, the guys who were, you know, younger, like, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we went to, check, so we went to uh, Checkpoint Charlie, which was um, turned out to be on the western side of Berlin, West Berlin, turned out to be uh, two or three or four big, long sort of mo mobile homes, motor homes, and um, each one represented like France, so the NATO countries, France, Germany, Britain, and um, I don't know who else, but, were, you know, you'd go through your the British one, and you'd come out the other end, and, and you'd be... Uh, there'd be a walkway into the eastern sector and you had there were like railroad tie railroad track driven into the the road all at different angles to stop people crashing through you know at the other side when you went through this little obstacle course at the other side was a big long uh, building uh, sort of the same as this, the other side a motor home not a motor home but a mobile home type thing and um you went in one end and hopefully you came out the other <laughs> So we pulled up to the, we went up, walked up to the desk, and we, each of us, had, uh, Brian and I, had taken the, the money, and we put it in the back of our passports, along with all the money we'd saved, and along with some Monopoly money, and all our, <laughs> and all our, and some English money. When we got paid, what happened is, when we got paid, we would um, go down to the English Seamen's Mission and change our money into British money so we didn't spend it all. So all I, right. had about, I had about $2,000 equivalent around that in money, not including the, this, the Monopoly money. So when we get to the counter, I hand over my uh, passport, and I let the back fall open, and all this money falls all over the desk. <laughs> So everybody starts grabbing at us, right? Of course, uh, guards walk forwards and push us away from the desk and everything. And then Brian starts waving the money he's got and our saxophone player. And in no time, we're separated from everybody else and put the other side of the desk. And they take the rest of the guys, along with two American guys who were going to Poland, and they take uh, our guys and they um, take them out of the country. They just said leave and they kept us there and they transported us to a big dark building sort of like the armory in new york city uh in these uh, half track vehicles with soldiers and everything oh my god was, it was pretty amazing like you know um pretty um, scary i would think 
Well, it wasn't scary to begin with. We were having a great time. I mean, we were... <laughs> Being carted off by the German police, the East German police. Yeah, that's a great time. I can think of hardly yeah, well, anything else I'd rather do. <laughs> well, what happened was they basically um, told us that we committed a serious offense. And the last people who had done that were... Um, um sentenced to 12 years hard labor oh and, they, and they were going to and they were going to give us several hours to think about it and then they left us alone and they didn't come back till the next morning and when they came back they said okay um well what we didn't know was when the boys went back the rest of the guys went back to the hotel they were they were euphoric they told the manager hey they took them away you know <laughs> <laughs> So our manager got in touch with the British Embassy. The British Embassy couldn't do anything at the time because it appears that only once a day could a, a communique be sent across between the two wow. areas, like, you know. And so we were sort of um we were sort of left there overnight. But anyway, the next morning they gave us two choices. They already knew that we were putting them on. The Germans, the, the East Germans, the Russians, they already knew that, you know, what we were doing. So they decided to treat, uh, to give us a, a, a harsh lesson. They said, um, you have two choices. Either you go to jail or we confiscate all the money you have of all different denominations, you know? <laughs> Including the Monopoly money, I assume. <laughs> uh, 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 we said we're leaving, sort of thing. That was it. You know, we said yes. So they took we'll all your money. It. So, yeah, and it took about an hour, an hour and a half to organize, two hours to organize getting rid of us again. So the half-track vehicles came back. They put us in those, and they drove us back. And when we got to, back to the Checkpoint Charlie again, um, Pathé News was there and, and people were standing on top of all the buildings and everything. It was like, you know, coming home parade, you know? Wow. And, and uh, yeah, we were taken to a, a, a better hotel and we were staying in. The Amzu, it was called. And then we were debriefed, they call it, by the British Embassy to see it, make sure we were treated okay. And it, it was fabulous. We got, we got great publicity from it. That's incredible. We got a question in the chat room. Uh, oh, good. Someone would like to know, um, what kind of work did you do with Led Zeppelin and The Who? Um, Led, Zeppel uh, Led Zeppelin and I worked on a second album. Um, bring as it on an engineer? Home. Yes, as an engineer, yeah. Um, a Whole Lot of Love. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, Lemon Song. Lemon Song, uh, Bring It On Home, um, Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. uh, worked actually worked on several other things, but it's hard to know if what we did there got on the album. You know, I see. But I but I know that the tracks I did and the, the you know, and then with mm -hmm. the Who I worked on the um, the sellout album. Um, I can see for miles and all that stuff. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. those were recorded in England. No, um, oh, those the, were in the uh, states. Yes, um, the uh, Who was done in New York. And uh, at a studio called Talent Masters, where at the time I was uh, just finished sleeping on the couch in the back. I'd only just started my career, like you know. Mm. And I knew that I knew the Who because they'd opened for us. We had a record out, and they didn't. So they opened for us on a tour in England in '64. And they heard I was in New York at a studio, so they rang up and said, "Hey, we're going to be in town. Can we come in and record for four or five days?" You know, and that was that. Mm. Now, we have a picture of you, I think, in uh, one of the studios uh, in your early years uh, at, the, at a very primitive-looking recording console, which uh, oh, when, John, oh. when John pulls that up, there it is. Oh, no, that's, uh, that's, a, that's actually not primitive. That was a fabulous studio. That was called Crystal, and that's hmm. when I was producing a group called Sweetwater uh, with a girl called Nancy Nevins. If you can see in the background, they've got uh, the 16-track... Uh, um, um, MM1000 uh, tape machine. That, that was the first Ampex multi-track machine up mm. after the 8-track. That was actually a converted, that was a converted um, video deck. And it was a, it was a, a monster. Because it being a converted, all they did was put tape heads on it, but there was 13, 13 inches of unsupported tape between the, the reels. So there was a lot of flutter on it. It was a terrible machine. <laughs> I thought he was going to put up. I thought he was going to put the picture of me in Talent Masters. Now that's an old picture. If he's got that one, unfortunately, I don't think I sent that one up there. So uh, okay, uh, yeah. We'll, uh, 
in any event, uh, so yeah, you've worked with some of the biggest names, obviously, in the business. Uh, you spent one of the last evenings with Keith Moon, in fact. Tell us about that. Um, I was in London with uh, Lee Oscar, the harmonica player from War. Um, and uh, we were doing uh, some string and choral overdubs at Air London Studios. And um, we went to a restaurant after um, one evening after we'd been recording. And um, there was, it was a dark restaurant, and there was a, a girl thing facing me that I was making fun of because uh, she, uh, she sort of had a ponytail with a knot on the side coming out, you know? It became a fad here, but at the time it was sort of funny, you know? So yeah. I was making fun of her, and her boyfriend was was a guy in a... It looked like a guy with long hair, and he had a big sweater on, he looked like big, you know? But he was had his back to me, like, you know? And she... Um, she she got upset about it and she said something to him and he turned around and he was he stood up and he came over the table and he said um uh, uh, chris austin and i said yeah and he said it's me mooney and i said <laughs> i said keith i didn't recognize you with the with the beard and everything you know and he said oh yeah how are you doing he said Oh, come on over to our table, like, you know, I said, well, I'm with the guys here, like, you know, he said, come in with us, like, you know, and um, so he ended up coming over our table and he ordered like a couple of bottles of champagne with orange juice and saying he got a gallon of orange juice at one o'clock in the morning in London, fresh <laughs> orange juice, you know, Whoa. so, so anyway, we talked for about an hour and then we went back to his hotel along with his girlfriend and he said, hey, I've got this um, great, um, a video from, and he had like, um, I guess it was a Betamax then, and it was uh, Bananas, the movie Bananas, you know, with, um, what's his Woody, name? Um, Woody Allen. Yeah, Woody Allen. So we sat down and we, he ordered some more champagne. And um, there now, what we year were. was this? This was um, 70, this was about uh, eight months before he died. Mm. In the, in, the, in the late 70s. Yeah, yeah, incredible. Now, there's one other story I, I have to hear and I have to share with our audience uh, because it's it's really quite incredible. You had dinner with Charlie Manson like two, <laughs> two weeks before the events that we all know. Actually, four months before. Four months, okay, still. The two, the two weeks was the other side of the, of the thing. Yes, um... I was friends with Dennis Wilson, and I was over there with a, a friend of mine called David Dalton, who was one of the um, the editors. Actually, he's the original editor at Rolling Stone magazine. And we used to go over and hang out with Dennis. And Dennis lived in this really nice English cottage with no furniture, just two hanging cane chairs and then pillows on the floor, a grand <laughs> piano. And of course, of course, he had a, a red Ferrari out back and everything, you know. Right. So it wasn't it wasn't that he couldn't afford the furniture or anything. But anyway, um, we're over there one day, and uh, he said, "Oh, Chris," he said, "before I forget," he said, "I've got this friend Charles, Charlie, and uh, maybe you could, you know, help him produce him or something. He needs help, like you know." As I recall, he wanted to be a songwriter and a singer songwriter, right? Well, actually, the uh, the. Um, the Beach Boys did record one of his songs. Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so um, I said, well, yeah, give, have him call me. So a couple of days later, Charlie Manson calls me. So we talked for a while, and he seemed okay, and he said, uh, why don't you come over and have dinner, like, you know, um, you know, hang out for a while, and we'll play some songs, like, you know. So he gave me the address and told me it was way out up at the north end of the, of the San Fernando Valley in the foothills, you know, and the mountains, like, you know. So I thought, oh, great, great. So I went out there with a girlfriend of mine, and... Um, I went out in my Mini Cooper because I thought it would be fabulous. It would be fabulous in the mountains, which it really was until we came to the dirt track that read, you know, it was like a, a car track read, led back into, into the, uh, where he lived. Like, you know, it was an old movie ranch called yes. Spawn Ranch. Mm -hmm. But the car, I ended up like driving on the middle of the road and, and uh, on one side of the road, I was like this, you know, all the time, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But anyway, in the end, I pulled up at the back of the house, and um, there were these three guys working on Volkswagens there, and they had the engines out, and like dune buggies, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they came running over, like, because they were 
loved the, the mini and we went in the house and the house was like an old farmhouse and um, there were two beds that were turned perpendicular to the wall sort of as couches in the daytime and in no time there was Tex Watson and, and uh, Charlie Watson and uh, Charlie Manson on one bed and I was sitting on the other bed facing them and all the kids were sitting on the floor around us and they were singing songs to me wow and, it was pretty amazing. All the kids were drawing in the choruses and things, and uh, there were no hit songs. There weren't bad songs, and with a bit of work, most probably would have made. You know, they could have been good. There were no hit songs, so right, right mm. off the bat. But then we had dinner, and um, the girls were in the kitchen making dinner while they were singing. It was even a girl with a um, a baby on her back and playing a violin. And um, all the crew that you heard about, uh, Squeaky From, well, of course, I didn't know them, you know, at the time. Right, you know, sure. Different. But anyway, uh, we had an incredible dinner. We had, they had a big uh, metal bowl with fresh fruit in. And what, well, not fresh fruit, canned fruit and fresh fruit. And he told me, like, you know, that uh, they went around all the uh, supermarkets in the, in the San Fernando Valley around 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning when they were stuck in the shelves. And they get all the dented cans and everything, you know, and... Uh, oh, the, the cans that they weren't going to put on the shelves. That's right, and all the past you, past you bananas and <laughs> fruit and everything. And he said, he said, even, even Dennis used to go on the runs with them, he said, like, you know, which was wow. surprising, you know, but I could see Dennis doing because he was a lot of fun, like, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, um, after dinner, we, we, we sat down the same... You know, a text on one bed with Charlie and then me on the other. And we had a conversation. And the conversation was about everything from religion to music to this to that. And it was, it was pretty interesting. And uh, he didn't seem, he was a little eccentric maybe, but he didn't seem, you know. Homicidal I mean, maniac. <laughs> He didn't seem, no, there was none of that, you know, and, and the fact that there were a lot of kids there, hardly anyone over 20, was not surprising at the time because, mm. you know, at the time there was lots of communes and lots of people like that, you know. Yeah. So anyway, the only thing that was bugged me a little bit while we were talking was that as Charlie would make a point, say, as some of you were talking about, the kids on the floor sitting around us would go, oh, right on, Charlie, you tell him sort of thing, you know? Mm. Which, you know... A um, little bit of hero uh, worship going on there. Yeah, and around um, 8.30, quarter to nine, I, it was not dark, you know, being California and everything, but I decided we ha I wanted to leave because I didn't want to uh, have trouble getting out with the car, like, you know, and kill the car, you know? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the Mini, the mini is a 12-inch you know, sort of wheelbase, like, you know. Right, so, right. I did, so I told Charlie, look, we're going to leave, like, and he said, well, before you go, let me show you, um, let me show you this, the, the ranch, like, you know, the, the, the movie set. So we walked out, and the first thing I said to him was, like, you know, what was all that BS back there with, with the kids, like, you know? And he said something that turned out to be very prescient. He said, um, oh, I take no notice. They're like my children. I'm like the king. Which wow. meant, you know, at the time meant nothing, but you, you look at it now like, you know, and you go, wow, you know? Yeah, yeah, and, that's incredible. You know? But anyway, a couple of days later, he showed up in my studio, which was called Mystic uh, in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And he came down with like five or six of the girls and guys, like, you know? And he loved the studio. And the thing he liked about the studio was not the sound or not the control room, not the studio, but the fact that the, each room, like the two offices, uh, had a couch and the, the lounge had two couches. And he, he said, like, well, you know, it, this is fabulous. We can stay here, like, you know, sleep here. And when we feel like recording, like, you know, we can go in the studio. Well, my business manager, Doug Moody, was standing behind Charlie and he was standing in the doorway. Doug was standing in the doorway of his office. And he's, he goes, he's shaking his head going, oh, no, you know, to me, like, you know, so I said, Charlie, look, you know, well, I can't do anything right now. Like, you know, we have, um, you know, I'm in the middle of an album right now. Like, you know, so, you know, we'll stay in touch. And nothing came of it. Like, you know, uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. of course, and then seven, four months later, uh, we know, all know what happened. Yeah. And the funny thing was that when he sent the, the kids over to Celio Drive, um, that was the home that um, Doris Day's son, uh, Terry Melcher, had been living at. And Terry had, ten, had told Charlie his music was terrible and didn't want to record him, you know. So uh, I was very and lucky, I think. Was he, in fact, the was that Char uh, Terry the the actual target of uh, the Manson family massacre, and Sharon Tate I, just got in the way? I can't say that 
you know, I have never seen that written or claimed, you know, but mm. the fact that he knew of the address oh, mm, speaks volumes, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one, one person in the chat room here is asking, have you written a book about all of this? <laughs> I, I've been trying to write a book for 20 odd years. I've got tons of stories written down. I made a big mistake at the beginning. I, t I tried to start at the beginning of my life and I sat down and very seriously tried to write about being in a, in a, in a pram, you know, baby carriage. And I couldn't get past the first, you know, the first <laughs> paragraph. And what happened was I found that I would tell stories when I did lectures, like, you know, and, I, and, and so I decided to write a story and it came out great. So I started to write all the stories separately. Now the problem is tying it all together. You know, yes. so that's what I'm doing. And I have a lot of help. I got a lot of people helping me to, you know, um, edit, editing it and helping me make sense of it all. You know, as long as I don't lose me in the, in the transition, it'll be fine, you know. Mm -hmm. You did send me a number of these stories as separate files, and they are all fascinating. So I really do hope you continue that process of compiling them together, whatever process you come up with that works for you great write the separate stories and separate files and file them away but putting them together into a book i think would be well worth the effort uh we do have another question we do have another question from the chat room which is other than uh the undertakers did you ever play or sing with any other uh relatively well-known groups um, I played with a group called Joey D and the Starlighters. That was the last time I played on stage. It was 1966. Mm. We'd met, uh, Joey D did a, had a hit with uh, Peppermint Twist. And we oh, yeah. met, yeah, we met Joey and his, his guys at the Star Club in Hamburg in 1962 and hit it off and we'd send postcards and letters to each other until we came to America in 65. And then the guys um, came over to it and visited with us. And then I got interested in, you know, and they, uh, they got interested in, you know, production after I saw how records were made in, in America. I, want, I didn't want to play anymore. I said, I can do this, you know. And then Davey Brigatti, the, one of the lead singers with Joey D, told me, he said, I've got a young brother. His name is Eddie Brigatti, you know, and he's in a group called the Young Rascals. Maybe I'll bring him down. Like, so he brought the group down. They were on. Uh, Atlantic Records, and I did a group uh, record with them called Groovin, and it sold three million, <laughs> and then it, it was uh, uphill from there, you know. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna get into your uh, producing and, and engineering uh, career here in just a moment. One other question from the chat room, I'd want to make sure I flip in here is: Did you ever work with Jimi Hendrix? No, but I, I met him several times, um, went to see him play a little. Actually, I went to see him play. A very interesting thing, when he came over, he used to hang out at a, a friend of mine, Deering Howe. And Deering was managing the two guys from my group, the, from our group, The Undertakers, um, Jackie Lowe Max and our drummer. When we broke up in New York, Jackie and Bugs, the drummer, uh, joined two American guys who were being managed by a, a well-off young man called Deering Howe. I think his grandfather was John Deere, you know? Oh, yeah. And, and um, um, Mitch and, uh, Te and Noel and, and Jimmy used to come over to the apartment and hang out. And we'd all be there. And Jimmy had just come back from England. And he hadn't, you know, played much in New York. And there was a new club downtown. And I, th uh, I can't think it was called The Revolution. It was on Christopher Street. And he, he was booked to play there. So we all went down as a big crowd. And the interesting thing was that this was uh, modeled on a... a new craze in, in France and it was called a new craze it was called a discotheque remember this was 1967 like you know mm -hmm. so we we go down there and and Jimmy gets on stage and plays away and at the end there's no applause I mean apart from us guys and Jimmy's just sort of standing there on stage and he uh, uh, it was an expletive, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just he a just few, said, yeah. Th thanks for, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, thanks for nothing, you know. Um, and he got off like so. We went backstage, helped him put everything away, and we all went back to Deering's house, you know. Yeah. So you know, so I, you know, I didn't see him after that, like you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, again, it just we're just scratching the surface on the stories of your life, and before we continue. Uh, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. It's got an easy-to-use user interface for creating and managing uh, your website or blog, and it's optimized for both beginners and CSS experts. 
There are hundreds of design templates to choose from, and you can customize any of them to fit your needs. Squarespace all-inclusive service includes several modules to build your website, including a blog module, forum, form builder, Flickr photo display, a Twitter widget, uh, Google Maps, and much more. Website tracking and built-in search engine optimizer are there as well, as, long, as well as uh, permission access handling, uh, cloud architecture for speed and site stability, and an innovative drag-and-drop Ajax interface. Not to mention an iPhone app, so you can log on to your website and update it from wherever you are. Use Squarespace for all your website needs. Build it, host it, and update it anytime. For a free trial, go to squarespace.com, sign up for a free account, no credit card needed, just try it out to build your website. Then if you decide to purchase, use the offer code HTG, that's Home Theater Geeks, and get a 10% uh, discount off the lifetime of your new account. Pretty good deal if you ask me. That's squarespace.com and use the offer code HTG. So, getting back with Chris Huston and the amazing stories of his life, uh, I'd like to focus now a little bit on after you were a musician, you became a recording engineer and a producer. And one of the questions that I always ask, that I've always wondered about is, what exactly does a producer do? I know what an engineer does. They sit there and they record and they check the levels and they do all that kind of stuff. But what does a producer do? Um, that's over to contention. A lot of producers don't do anything. But a producer that knows his ropes, he's the person that is an honest mirror for the artist. Not a funhouse mm. mirror where everything is fun and everything is, works right. Yeah, do that, do this. He's an honest mirror. He has enough uh, integrity. Uh, um, he knows the ropes in the studio. He knows music. That the artist can take his word. If he says, look, you're not uh, doing the best you can do, he'll try it again, you know? And mm -hmm. that, a good producer is, is an honest mirror. That's the easy way to answer it. There are so mm. many there's so many other angles, you know, but that's it. An honest mirror. Yeah. Okay. When you're when you're engineering, are you thinking about the end result that is, you know, the final mix, the final product as you're recording the individual tracks, or is something else going on? Um if you were doing a concept album you would be constantly aware of the goals that you're, uh, you know, the, the need to stay focused on um, a common thread that you hope to put between everything. But normally when you're working in a studio, um, the music is in flux, the performances are in flux as the musicians, you know, feel the way around a song and you try to stay open. You're always, your job is to get the best performance out of the song, out of the artist, out of the engineer, out of the studio, out of everything. That's so, as, a, as a producer you're talking about. As a producer, yes. Now, as an engineer, um, your job is to get the, well, here, here's another thing. If you were back in the old days, okay, now this, this is, this might be more to the point. Back in the old days, everyone played live in a studio. Mm. Right? And the art of making records back then was capturing the performance. In fact, back then, you were, you were capturing the performance. Today, you had everybody create... in the same room, playing all at the same time, all Sing... mic... Yes, and singing also. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and your job was to capture that performance. Now, today, we're creating a performance. You could do the drums in Tokyo, the bass in San Francisco, come to the sound kitchen to mix or do the vocals. I mean, you can record in an apartment. What used, mm. to, take, what used to take two trucks to deliver can now be put in the trunk of a, of a Honda, you know, set up on a <laughs> kitchen table, you know? <laughs> so so when, you, when you said that, it made me think, like, in the old days... Um, you had to have an idea, but you usually got your ideas. As an engineer, you walked around. The, if you were a smart engineer, you walked around the room, not just listened to the speakers, but walked in the room and f listened to the energy. Because in those days, the musicians created their own, their own dynamics. Mm -hmm. they, played, they played between each other. They didn't wear earphones most of the time early on. And the energy that they had in the room, the magic, the suspension, all came from that live performance playing off each other in the room. In the room. And that was the key. Whereas today, 
with headphones on, you tend to play in a straight line because the, the volume is constant. So you tend to play, if you're playing a guitar, you're just playing straight ahead. You know, your dynamics are going to be a lot different than if, you, than if you're in a live performance, you know? Do you and miss then, those old days of, of playing live? This is a question I, from the chat room. I do. I do. When I work with like, you know, people like Benny King, the Drifters, Patti LaBelle or James Brown, there was a magic in the room when the, everybody knew when they were on a performance. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew that magic moment. And if you were a good engineer, you captured it. Uh, you were in a lot of trouble if you missed it, you know? <laughs> that, and that's why, you know, you, people say, you know, well, this, this is this old record. And you can hear a mistake on it, you know? Yeah. Well, you weren't willing to sacrifice a wonderful performance for somebody kicking a microphone stand or dropping something, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, which was the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. What about stuff like mic bleed? I mean, when, you're, when everybody's in the same room playing, and I certainly understand the importance of that as a musician myself, um, but when you've got a bunch of microphones in the same room and everybody's playing together, don't you have a lot of bleed from one, from one instrument into somebody else's mic? And how do you deal with that as an engineer? Um, way back... Recording studios were designed to enhance live performance. Mm. Okay, so when everybody's playing in a room, in fact, Talent Masters, the studio that I started at, only had 12 microphones. So I'd record 20, 25 people with five, it was 12 microphones. There might be five on the horns and the strings, the rest would go on vocals and, and, and the rhythm section, you know? The drums had two mics, one overhead, one kick, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, um, bleed was an important part of the magic. In fact, I had a real hard job later on when multi-track recording came along, getting used to uh, reverberation like EMT plates and artificial reverberation. I, I tended to make things too dry because I, that the sound of artificial reverb just didn't sound natural. I was so used to 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 moving instruments to get the timber to get the depth mm -hmm. but i i had a hard job uh, adapting to artificially doing it mm -hmm. and it also brings up another thing when multi-track recording came out um like eight track say eight track that was the first big thing all of a sudden you had the ability to put the instruments on separate tracks which you didn't have early on, you know, you go direct to four track or something, but with, right. you know, eight track and then right away after that, 16 and 24, all of a sudden you had the ability to put everything on separate tracks. Wow. But it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is exactly for the, what you said, the bleed. Mm. Okay. So all of a sudden these beautiful rooms that were designed to enhance live performance were basically, um, a dinosaur, a hindrance to the modern th recording techniques that were coming along. So, in a further, in a further, you know, effort to enhance the separation, they deaden studios. And so, this they, is why we have really dead studios today. Um, yes, yeah. Like if you listen to records from the seventies, you'll find the bass is very low and shallow but full but very low and the highs are very brittle and thin mm. which is it which is you know um this is a, a an acoustic um uh, effect of having a room that's too drained of of uh, kinetic energy uh, that's mm. what you lost mm. so then of course that i assume led you into doing some acoustical uh, studies and, and ending up being an acoustical engineer. Uh, was that, was that part of the process that led you in that direction? Um, that happened because the studio that I was, uh, sleeping on the couch on to start with, Talent I Masters. ended up, uh, Talent Masters, uh, Atlantic Records started to use it for all their artists, all their R&B artists. They just wanted mm -hmm. to use it. They loved the room. It had a single pane of glass in their window. One six uh, Altec 604E speakers, uh, 12 microphones, but it had a hell of a sound, you know? Yeah. Atlant Atlantic ended up buying the studio, buying the two partners out, but keeping me. 
Mm. And the first thing they said was, look, Chris, we cannot keep the studio like it is. It's terrible. You know, we, uh, because, you know Atlantic had these beautiful modern studios up on Columbus Circle. And uh, all of a sudden, they bought the studio that looked like a, a, a yard sale, you know? I mean, uh, mm. you know, the, the white tiles, you know, but not everywhere. And, you know, it just, it was uh, so, my job was to remodel it. So mm. what I did, I put in stereo speakers in the control room, double the size of the control room, and did a little bit of work on the studio uh, just to freshen it because the sound in the studio, I was smart enough, I think, to realize that I didn't want to mess with this because I didn't understand it, but I knew that, that certain parts of the room worked incredible f for some instruments, and I wasn't about to change that. So I just f made, freshened it up a little bit, but I did change the control room. Mm. Um, and yet, uh, you have, in, since that time, done a lot of acoustical design work, both in professional recording studios and now in home theaters. Uh, what, what can you tell me about the difference between the two in terms of designing them acoustically? Well, start in the control room. The contr um, both environments, a control room and, say, uh, an audiophile listening room. Mm -hmm for listening to music enjoying music and i think we but have the, a picture of the of the control room you're sitting in now if uh, if john can pull it up while you're talking about it yeah um a control room um is different from a audio file listening room in one major way the way that the the amount of uh, sound staging. Audio files have this wonderful word. It's like a sound stage. Mm -hmm. and, what, and what that means to them is, is an addition to what's coming out of the speakers. It's like broadening and widening their perspective and imagery. And it's mm -hmm. wonderful. It, it's, it, it, you know, it's incredible. But in a recording studio, in a control room, you cannot do that because if you were listening to an enhanced, an artificially or an acoustically enhanced um, mix you may not add reverberation or separation to instruments because you're hearing them uh, in the room you need to hear exactly what is coming out of the speakers mm. in fact behind me you can see two yamaha uh, ns10ms those two very are very common in in recording studios those are uh, as i understand it they these little speakers little bookshelf speakers from yamaha are meant to represent the typical home listener's uh, audio system. That was the theory. In fact, yes. these, are, these have been out since the 70s. And uh, I, ha I have a pair in my own home studio. Yeah, <laughs> and they're terrible. They're terrible speakers. <laughs> but, but, but if you get a mix on those, like they have a hump at 125, but if you turn them up to a certain level and you, get, and you learn them, and you take that out of the studio to a home or in your car, you have a mix. There's something about them. Now, mm. nowadays, nowadays, you've got 20 or 30 different choices. Everybody and their brother make uh, near-field monitors now, you know. But the Yamahas behind me, they work, still work fine, and everyone uses them. Yeah, so it's a standard reference, uh, not for it hearing exactly what you're recording. For that, you need bigger speakers and most studios have giant speakers some of sometimes built into the walls of the control room but for hearing what you think it might sound like uh, in a typical home system those yamahas actually come in pretty handy as a reference right yes yes well behind me on each side i'm um, up in the, uh, just behind me here they've got the forty thousand dollar speakers you know mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and um they're very very loud they they turn those on to listen to the program material because there may be artifacts and their noises is you don't hear at low level you know yeah 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 but, but but the real trick is if your mix translates between the you know the small speakers and the big speakers you know you're on the right track right what about here's a question i've always had what about um the fact that most recording studios have very non-parallel walls the ceiling is raked and the walls are not parallel. Even the floor sometimes has different steps to it. Um, and yet most home, home theaters, home listening rooms are not that way. Here's a picture of the, uh, of the recording room, the big room, looking into the window, into the control room. But even that doesn't have parallel walls. Uh, what, no. What's your thought on that? 
Well, um, the main concern is flutter echoes. And that's, you know, uh, uh, an echo that happens on axis between two parallel services. Mm -hmm. Okay, so by uh, moving the uh, walls like 15 degrees, any sound that bounces off the opposite wall is redirected, but 15 degrees can bring it back to a point that's further away than the original mm -hmm. and, and doesn't set up uh, a continuous flutter. So, um, mul so 15 degrees or multiples of, you know? Mm -hmm. So why aren't, why aren't more listening rooms, home listening rooms built that way? I mean, obviously you have a room in a house, you don't have a lot of choice, but there are people who build dedicated listening rooms and you've designed plenty of them. Are they designed that way? We, um, a lot of our rooms, um, we use um, sidewall diffusion using um, um, multiple angled or semi-round um, uh, um, diffusion systems in order, mm -hmm. to, uh, in order to affect the sound stage. You know, we talk to the client and find out how they listen, what they want to hear, and we try and, you know, and try and accommodate the room. Instead of moving the walls, we put things on the walls which, you know, if you move the wall, you're moving one wall. But if you put something on the wall, you can cause multiple diffusion. You don't want one hard um, reflection. You want multiple diffusion, you know? Mm -hmm. I think we so have a that... couple of pictures of some of the rooms you've done. Uh, if we can oh, pull right. those up, okay. the home theater rooms. Um, uh, and, and you were talking about diffusion, uh, which is clearly an important thing. But also this, uh, this idea of non-parallel walls is, is interesting to me. And something that very few people actually get to do. There's one. Yeah, yeah. actually, that um, those walls are um, a lot more than 15 degrees. No, no, that's a distorted picture. Oh, I see. Uh, that, the wide angle a, lens. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's a distorted picture. Um, they do have uh, some angles in it, but they're not. Uh, that's um, you know. It looks worse than it is there. <laughs> You can say that. <laughs> Here's another one of the rooms you've worked on. Yep. Yes. And this one, uh, instead of having um, angled walls, it has, it has different services, which are not a linear service, one linear service. So you, you use uh, columns, uh, mm -hmm. you use uh, different services within the wall system in order to, in order to accommodate and cause uh, multiple reflections, you know, and we even plot out where those, you know, center point where those reflections will end up so that we can, you know, get a wide dispersion to the, um, the sweet spot in the room. Mm -hmm. Can you, can, can you, um, what do you, what do you need to do to widen the sweet spot or increase the sweet spot so that more than one person can enjoy that, that really good sound? Um, it's the angle of the diffusers. And we use ceiling diffusers as well as wall diffusers, mm -hmm. like like clouds, uh, and um, um, all to you know putting summing everything together. You're able actually to to make the room very kinetically live, I incredible for music. It's like if you play something soft, it has dimension, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and if you play something loud, it just it, it you know it, it it doesn't sound flat. It has energy, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's the exact opposite to what you would do in a control room. A control room can't be dead because dead rooms fatigue the ears, you know? Yes. And, you know, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yes, I, I, I understand that. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to mix records in an anechoic chamber, for example. No, 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 that would be <laughs> counter, counterproductive. Yes, yes. One more question I have for you that, I've, that I ask engineers, recording engineers, whenever I can, and that is, it seems to me that when I've been in recording studios and watched and listened to engineers doing their stuff, they tend to listen very loud at very high levels. In fact, I know an engineer here in L.A. whose license plate is loud mixer. Now, what is the reason for that? Clearly, you're putting yourself, those of you who, those engineers who do that, put themselves at high risk for hearing damage. Uh -huh. uh, over time and so what is the purpose of doing that well the uh, it goes back to the 70s again when things got really big and studios started to you know the the art of the the act of recording became almost more important than the 
music, you know? Mm -hmm. It took four it took four hours minimum to get a drum sound sometimes. Things like mm -hmm. that, you know? Which was terrible, like, you know? Yeah. But part of that was that they put huge speakers in the studio and, and artists that um that have imbibed in illegal substances, you know, they, they, they like to hear um, loud music, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I know myself many times I've had to walk out of the control room till the end of a, a take, you know, and um, just to get out. Just too this, loud? Oh, nosebleed, you know? I mean, just, <laughs> you know, I mean, pin you against the back wall type stuff. I mean, yeah. really. And and the fact is, those speakers were so incredible, you could play them loud. Mm. And I've and I've noticed that the better the speakers, the louder the music is played. You know. Mm -hmm. I've often thought that one possible explanation was that as you get louder and louder and louder, the sensitivity of the human hearing system kind of flattens out. <laughs> I think and there's a lot of a lot of truth in that. There may be something to that. I don't know. Anyway, uh, we've come to the end of a fascinating hour, and I want to thank you, Chris, uh, for Hi. being on the show and sharing some of your incredible life story with us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Great. Thank you so, so much. Uh, you can learn more about uh, Chris at his website, chrishuston.com, and you can learn about his work at, in the home theater arena at reevesaudio.com, R-I-V-E-S audio.com, the company that uh, he works for that uh, uh, installs uh, home theaters. And uh, I'm looking forward to having actually uh, Richard Reeves on at a future time to talk more about their work. But uh, so far today, this has been just fascinating. My, my online homes are ultimateavmag.com and hometheatermag.com. And you can email me at scott at twit.tv and follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Theo Kalamarakis, one of the world's preeminent home theater designers. So we're going to go much further down that road than we did today and should be a fascinating conversation. So I sure hope you'll join me then. Until then, geek out. <laughs>